Hello, my name is David Bryan, and this is Curiosity Invited, a podcast inspired by endless curiosity. Tune in for an open-minded conversation about interesting and important things. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Curiosity Invited. My name is David Bryan, and today I have the pleasure, once again, always a pleasure when I get to speak with my good friend, Mario Johansson. Mario, Mario and I worked together for many years. We are good friends, and um, but that doesn't mean we don't poke at each other periodically. And so, so um, Mario is Ma- Mario is just one of those incredibly accomplished human beings who he's got. Uh, isn't it two masters? You've got one in philosophy and then one in what? Uh, well, actually, it's three now: one in it's... philosophy, Spanish language, and then the third one oh, now is urban Spanish. education. Spanish language. I forgot that. You got a yeah. master's. <laughs> oh my lord. So he is highly educated, highly schooled, and probably running out of <laughs> running out of steam with like interacting with institutions after all those years and all those masters. Anyway, he works at a school that is bla- blazoned across his chest, New Road School, started in 1995 co-started by by me uh it was a school i i was the head of for many years and that's how mario and i met he was a he he was he was a tutor turned teacher turned master teacher turned turned you know turned teenager whisperer turned turned just a just a uh a person who sees the world and has a lot to say about it that I think is super valuable. So, so welcome, Mario. Thanks for doing this again. Um, uh, you know, your, 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 our original podcast is, is still up and buried in. And so, if, you know, if, there it is. Keep it buried, please. Uh, keep it's not it buried. buried. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, it's available to the public, but you know, you never know. So, so somebody may see this and go, Ooh, I'd like to see that original one. And, <laughs> So anyway, thank you um, so much, David. It's so, a pleasure so, being here. So education, yeah? You're not tired of it yet, huh? No, I'm I'm actually not tired of it yet. I'm I'm it it, it can be tiring at certain junctures. And right now I think kind of nationally we're at one of those very tiring junctures for educators. But um, you know, I'm I'm my fortitude is strong, I'm in it for the long haul, my stamina is still up. I'm 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 blessed after all these years to still have the stamina to wanna be inspired to stay in, you know, the struggle because right now there's absolutely a major struggle that's happening in American education right now that, that's playing out in all of our daily lives for people, for kids and families. So tell me, what what how would you how would you describe that struggle? What's the struggle, at least that piece of it, right? And we should say that New Roads is New Roads is a, a private school, an independent school, um, so it doesn't suffer some of the uh, the challenges that 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 large public schools suffer, um, especially in large cities. Um, New Roads is in the Los Angeles area, but um, but unlike most independent schools, New Roads devotes an enormous amount of its budget to need based financial aid. So it was not. You know, New Roads was not started because it was because because Los Angeles needed another private school. It was really quite specifically an effort to open the doors to more families who could not otherwise um, afford the sort of tuitions that independent schools have to charge to keep the lights on. And um, and well, maybe they don't have to keep the they don't have to charge that much to keep the lights on, but. Uh, because and Neuros is an example of that. So, so, but it does have certain um, certain freedoms and from um, from some of the outside societal uh, challenges, whether that's whether that's crowd, um, you know, crowded classrooms or um, or answering to a governmental authority that is. Um, overreaching sometimes so so but that having 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 said that um it's not without its it's not without its challenges so so you specifically were talking about so it's challenges right now so like what what do you what do you got in mind well let me just say uh i think it's it's important also to 
specify, I thank you for the, the qualification you gave to kind of, you know, situate New Roads and give a picture of where New Roads, you know, is established in the private school enclave on the west side of Los Angeles. Um, there's one thing that I'd like to add to that, and that is that one of the major components of the establishment of, of New Roads for you and for Paul Cummings was create an environment that looked like Los Angeles, a school environment that looked like the city of Los Angeles, which right. most West Side private schools don't. They are clearly they are clearly catering to a specific demographic. And so New Roads comes along and says, we just want a school that for one of the major features is that it looks like the city of Los Angeles. And we've been able to maintain that. It's an incredibly diverse environment that really does look like the city of Los Angeles. The, the fast forward to the new current head of school, one of the ways that Lutheran Williams describes the head of school as he said, uh, pardon me, the uh, New Roads as he says, New Roads is a, a private school with the public heart. And I say that I established that being important because what happens is that in this conversation, it's true that in many respects, independent schools have been shielded from the major onslaught of what's happening in American education, the some of the worst parts of it. But New Roads, interestingly, because of it being a private school with the public heart, um, we have an interesting relationship in terms of, of, of more folks willing to engage us in that conversation of what's happening in the public space. So we're in a very unique place where there is there are elements of, um, well, quite frankly, elitism, right, where we can we, where we're shielded from that. And but then there are other areas where. We're not shielded from that, where we have lots of families where many of the, the majority of the kids in the family are in public schools, um, where the, the, they're blended families. Some of the kids are in charter. Some of the kids are in public. Some of the kids are in private. So and, and because of the kind of school that we are, people, families will engage us about the landscape of public education and how it impacts mm -hmm. what's happening in independent education vis-a-vis -a, -vis a progressive school like New Roads. And and just to be clear, like the, I mean, I think the reason for that, tell me if I'm wrong, the reason for that uh, that mix that, you know, parents who have some kids, if we went you know, a kid at New Roads and a kid someplace else and a kid at a public school and a kid looking to be in a charter school, the reason is, is quite specifically, is, you know, families are looking for the best situation for their kids, right? And, and, and... And they'll put together a hodgepodge, even if it means extra extra driving or extra transportation, or they'll put together a hodgepodge of 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 educational opportunities for their kids because they're looking for the best for their kids and the most appropriate for their kids. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, yeah, yeah. Well, just going to say uh, as an example that we literally have parents that are dropping the kids off one kid at New Road at six a.m. in the morning. That's why we right. keep twenty four hour security there. Sick, dropping one kid off at 6 a.m., running over to the other side of town to get a kid dropped off at a charter school, and then one kid who is doing public education near the house because typically K through 6, the public education system is still functional for many families at that point. And so they're literally running around in the morning, like you said, to drop the kids off at a multitude of places to try right. to give them access to the best education possible in right. this very difficult city for families trying to get their kids educated. Right. And um, the other thing, which we didn't say, is that you've been at New Roads in a bunch of different capacities for over 20 years, right? I mean, it's got to be 20, what, 25, 23? Yeah, it's it's actually 26. This is 26, 26. years. I can't even. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. <laughs> I didn't even think you were 26 years old, Mario. So, <clears throat> um, so, so. Let, let, let's go. Let's dive right into the hard question. That well, a hard question. Um, one of the conversations that is, at least that I that I know of, that is in the public eye at the moment is, you know, affirmative action. Right? Isn't it time? I mean, it's on. This is at the Supremes. The Supreme Court's talking about it. Right? They're going to make a decision about it when it comes to different colleges. Um. um does New Roads have an affirmative act action approach, uh, policy, and and does that affect the students? And does that affect the teaching? And 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 is it a good idea? Uh, well, let me see. When I think about 
uh, affirmative action as a public policy, of course, I tend to think about the public implications of it, the historical and public implications of it and how it how it kind of all played out. And there's a lot of feelings about that. I mean, um, certainly someone who is grounded in reasoning philosophically, I, I, I will be direct and say, I have a lot of issues with it. I have a lot of issues with that kind of an approach to the sociocultural and historical problem that we faced and to use that as a measure for public uh, public redress. A, 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 an affirmative action policy that specifies a demographic of people and says we want to make a, a, a special access route available for that group of people is replete with all kinds of difficulties that we could we could really you know dive into and that could kind of that, that's that's its own conversation. Um, the other part of that conversation is a more practical part of that conversation. The practical part of that conversation is, you know, um, affirmative action is responsible for largely responsible for creating America's current black middle class. Right. My family comes out of that. My mom was a recipient in the 70s of affirmative action policies. And she was one of those, you know, single moms that, you know, went to Los Angeles City College and transferred to UCLA and did her bachelor's and then all the way up to her PhD and 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 you know, as a single mom. And so and it it transformed our lives absolutely. And I know lots of people like that. And so um, so kind of there are two mindsets when I think about. You know, affirmative action as it as it as it historically played out. Fast forward to the implications of affirmative action oriented policies that informed how schools like New Roads, inclusive progressive schools like New Roads, conduct business. I wouldn't say that there's an affirmative action policy, but would I say that many of our inclusive measures are informed by the tradition uh, of affirmative action? Absolutely, I I would say that. So how does it, so what does that look like? Does that mean, does that mean uh, you count test scores this much and, but for this group of students, you count test scores only this much? No, or, uh, well, fortunately, fortunately again for us, we did not get into a calculus. So we didn't get into a calculus. We didn't get into litmus tests. We didn't get into standards like that. For us, it, uh, for, again, fortunately, uh, the founders, again, of our school, <laughs> right, <laughs> kind of factored into. I quite played, specifically avoided that. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Play with all of those notions. And, 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 and fortunately for us, thought about the problems of incorporating that into the operation of the school. Right. But what they did was they said, okay, the intentions of what that seeks to do, right? To create an inclusive dynamic environment where people understand that you actually are more intellectually, socioculturally engaged by difference in the learning process. That, that, that when you engage difference in the learning process, you have high academic expectations, but are informed by different sociocultural and historical experiences, it actually enriches the educational journey. And so kind of what happens for us is those elements play into how admissions takes place. But we also, again, as a progressive school, move beyond race, class, gender, right? Again, the, the, the traditional conversation around affirmative action plays out at those those three pillars, right? Race, class, gender. Whereas New Roads has taken this notion of diversity, differentiation, difference, and said, well, there's linguistic difference. There's or, there's sexual orientation difference. There's gender identity difference. There is neural uh, processing differentiation. There are so many, di there's uh, linguistic differentiation. Uh, there are so many different expressions of differentiation, and the goal for us is to develop a culture and a community that is based in a radical embracing of diversity and radical embracing of difference and inclusion and saying that that is really the center of dynamic engagement and learning. And, well, obviously it's been successful, or it continues to be successful and not without struggle and not without challenge and all those things. Um, are there challenges? Have you do you know of challenges to the administration of that practice rather than rather than, hey, you know, my kid 
my kid can walk on water in all these different ways. So, so why are you saying no? Yeah, I, I absolutely have. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm the guy that receives all of those, those oh. challenges. <laughs> oh, good. And so I've kind of, I've kind of had all the kind of the gamut, you know, I, it, it brings to mind a, a conversation I had with a parent, right? Not too long before we went on break where a parent called and, and one of the affinity groups, an affinity group at the school um, referred to, uh, this is a Latino affinity group called Latinos Unidos, and they reached out for a dinner that they were that they were organizing and one of the parents called to say hey my child got this invitation to this latino dinner and we were disturbed by it why is neuros dividing kids up into latin into black into the and i started explaining to the parent that the school wasn't dividing the parent was very agitated though the parent was very agitated and was and was, was you know our family is very multicultural very multiracial we have lots of different people in our family and we don't believe in any kind of division and and the parent did not didn't recognize it, but they were they were mostly relying on they were I think they were trying to express an experiential reality that sought to move above this that the complexities of that conversation. But what they were ultimately advocating was kind of what we refer to as a colorblind philosophy, right? We don't right. we don't see color. And right. um, and I was explaining to the parent that first I said. Well, um, dad, none of this is driven by the school. So let's start there. The school creates opportunities for the students to organize in the way that feels comfortable for them. So the school doesn't take any active position in requiring anything or making the students do anything. The students organize the space and the students open up the opportunity. So this particular group, Latinos Unidos, is a Latin-based affinity group and they are inviting others, other Latino students in to identify with the experience and to find that, that commonality there in the New Roads environment. We then later got into deeper conversations about that because, again, the parent expressed some reservations about that. And I said, well, you know, if we get into the details of the program, the affinity work that we do, one of the requirements that we have, we have two things that I'm really proud of about the way that we do affinity work at New Roads. Number one, you cannot have exclusive spaces at New Road School, okay? This is a longstanding contribution from our founding head of school, David Bryan, who <laughs> did not believe in, that thought that was strange. And I agree with that, that why, well, why would you do that in an absolute exclusive space? So at the same time, okay, how do you do affinity work and not have an exclusive space? So so folks will always say, it seems like you're contradicting yourself, Mario. No, I'm not contradicting myself here. So we created a policy, you know, that is essentially referred to as welcome, not invited, right? So you're welcome into the space, but you weren't invited into the space, which, which means that first is that the affinity group has the a responsibility every semester to facilitate uh, activities, events where they invite community members into their space to say, this is what we're doing. Because any work that we do at New Road School is mission specific. You can't have a separate mission from what we're doing at the school, okay? So you can't take a Latino group and say, we're organizing, it's only Latino people organizing. We have this separate agenda of the reason why we're organizing. I can support that potentially at four o'clock outside of school, across the street from New Road School. But when you're in New Road School, all efforts that we engage in at New Road School are mission, mission centered. They're about the fulfillment of our mission. And so the way that that looks is, you have to have events that are specifically designed to call folks in because New Roads is a, a calling in culture. We're not a calling out, checking or canceling culture. We're a calling in culture. So, so, so why we, why did this fan, did every family or every student get an invitation to this? Every student did not know that what in this particular situation what happened was it was just the Latino students because they were reaching out on the basis of uh, of affinity, and now between you and me, it was a it was a, it was a teenager thing because they they just screwed up on the instructions that they were given. For for how to organize the kids, right? <laughs> you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens in, in K-12 spaces up. all the time. <laughs> huh. 
<laughs> so what was supposed to happen was they were supposed to visit the campus's town halls, make an announcement and invite the kids who wanted to speak to them afterwards for an invitation to the space. Right. The, the kids missed the, the town halls that they were supposed to go to. So they thought, oh, we'll just pull the names and reach out to them, which right opportunity, a, 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 a chance to have a conversation around making assumptions about people and based on names, complexions, right. opinions. How did you, how did you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> gave us a I, chance. I just want to tell you, I, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm doing a, a podcast with a gentleman named Mauricio Fraga Rosenfeld. So... <laughs> So last names. <laughs> exactly. Well, you can imagine Mario Vincent Johansson, all the stuff that I have gotten throughout my life, exactly. you know, where I show up and they're like, Oh, you're Swedish, right? <laughs> correct. I show up and they tell me we need some ID, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so wait, but, but okay. So, so how did it end up with this family? So with his, uh, with his dad. So, it, well, strangely, you know, sometimes people do this and we all know this tactic, right? It's, it's, you know, when you, when you call the phone company to complain about something, you tell them, Hey, well, my brother's here and he's a phone technician. So he know he's giving me all the answers. So, so I'm in the middle of this conversation and suddenly I hear another voice and the, you know, he, the gentleman says, well, this is my mom and she's the head of diversity at UCLA. This, uh, and so I began to engage her. It was very clear that no, she didn't have a background in, 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 in equity work and, you know, just kind of the way that she was engaging the conversation but i you know i i ultimately said to them our, our our goal is to again call families into this conversation so if you could fundamentally tell me what is the problem that you have with something like this then i would like to speak to that because i don't i i i don't necessarily think it's productive for me to try to defend the school on the basis of the policies i want to really connect with you and I want to speak to what your concerns are. And so um, they ultimately said to me, well, you know, our, our child already has a lot of identity issues with them being a multiracial child. And so having, and I said, I, I said, well, we got into that conversation and that ultimately is really <laughs> we, what the conversation We have about. an affinity group for that as well. <laughs> and that's what I said. That's ultimately what I said is I said, yeah. is I said, I well, first is, um, thank you for trusting me yeah. and my offer and leaning into that and then leaning into really sharing with me what's really going on within the family structure and with your child. And I want you to know that New Roads has been a place where multiracial families, transracially adopted families have found a great sense of community and belonging because of the way that we hold space. And the affinity groups for the kids are transformative spaces for that kind of work. And I think in your situation, what has happened is that your child is in the wrong space. So I have a multiracial affinity group also that grew out of the kids themselves determining, hey, right. if I go to the Black Students Union, there are conversations there that don't resonate with me. If I go to the Asian Students Union, there's conversations that don't resonate with me there. Partially they do, but they don't fully. And then that's how we ended up with the multiracial students union, where those students ended up organizing, coming together and saying there needs to be a multiracial space that speaks through within and through and above all of the other conversations. And can I, can I like, let me ask you, what's 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 the expressed goal or what's the understood goal of the affinity groups or having affinity groups is it is it is it the comfort of the students is it what what is it that's what, what, what is that what is everybody really trying question. to achieve that's a really great question david uh, so with the way that we look at the the affinity work is is the affinity work is an expression really of the mission also right the mission talks about um uh, equipping young people with the tools and the resources they need for an ever expanding and changing world, right, is some of the language that's used within the mission. So when we get down into the particulars of that, it's like, well, what does that look like? Well, the world we live in today is, is informed by this racial history that sets up a certain sociocultural dynamic. And what our objective is, is 
to speak to that and speak to the lived reality that students experience as young people coming into all of that, right? Young people often ask, well, why have we been fighting over these issues for so long? Why is it taking so long to change these issues? Why are why why when I look back into the history, I see my my mom was dealing with these issues and my grandmother was dealing with these issues and there were issues about you know exclusion of LGBT folks and disabled folks and neurodivergent. What happened? Where does all this come from? So there's the narrative part of explaining that to kids. Let me walk you through the history and give you a narrative of that. And then there's the experiential part of it. And so the affinity work is really meant to give concrete flesh and bones context to those realities and to say they can do both and, right? Kind of what Dan Siegel talks about when he says, we want to honor the differences and promote the linkages. And so the affinity work gives us an opportunity to manifest that on a lived level, but also teaching the, the kids in the New Roads community that's an intentional exercise that doesn't happen by itself. Okay. So right. th there is a way to do it. And so right. one of the, one of the features that we talk about with climate and culture at new roads is, is um, holistic integration and holistic integration is this concept, this notion that of bringing folks together across a wide spectrum of difference, but doing it holistically. In other words, what that looks like is, and again, something I learned directly at new roads. So we had many years ago, because uh, New Roads is doing this kind of really push the envelope equity work way before it was called equity work and all this all this kind of stuff. Well, we had a really dynamic and excited facilitator slash practitioner at the time at the early history of New Roads who facilitated a day of activity and um, kind of process work around our difference. And so her idea was creating affinity spaces where people could go into affinity spaces and discuss their issues and then come back together and bring those together to a larger venue. But what she didn't know at that time, because again, we were all new to all this work, she didn't understand the whole notion of what we now call scaffolding and capacity building to that experience. So everyone showed up at school that morning and it was like Black, Korean, Latino, white, Korean, and we had all manner of hell break loose, okay? Because New Roads kids are not about being divided. So the way they experienced that was suddenly you're putting us in boxes and you're dividing us. And coming out of that, we, we, we just to close that story really quickly, we had a hell day. And then at the middle part of the day, the head of school said, shut it all down, get everybody together in the middle of the school. And we just have to tell the kids we fucked up. Okay. <laughs> and we just got to tell them this didn't go as we planned, but let's talk about what we intended and get you in the conversation about what needs to happen, which, I, meant, which ended up being an amazing day. <laughs> an amazing thing. I remember that vividly, vividly. <laughs> Absolutely. But, and we did, we screwed up. And, the, and, the, and there were moments along the way that, that rather than sort of a, mo a moment took place where, oh, we have the opportunity now to set it straight, but instead it was no insisting, no, you have to choose between your Latino heritage and your black heritage. It's like, it just got worse and worse. We just kept <laughs> turning it, it was terrible. So, but, that's but ultimately- what... That was a great day oh, for everybody, ultimately. Golden, golden. I, the, that is all still the content that I still draw on today because what that what I learned yeah. in that moment because I remember feeling that complete overwhelming moment of feeling overwhelmed and powerless, but also feeling we're the adults and we have to stay in charge, right? Because, you know, I kind of, that's the way yeah. I grew up was yeah. that, you know, we have to stay in charge. So we have to, we can't let the kids see. The, and so seeing leadership, seeing the head of school say, it's okay to tell them we screwed up. It's okay to turn around to them and say what needs to happen and ask them for direction. That changed my life as an educator, right? Because it really taught me about the power of presence of all the individuals in the space and to, to have the ability, I don't want to say to, to um, disregard the traditional roles, because if you work at a school, you know, you have to have some respect sometimes for the traditional roles, but it taught, what it taught me was presence teaches you when you need to plug in at the level of, okay, this is not the moment for your traditional role. 
This now this is the right. moment to throw out right. the traditional role. Nobody right. needs the school official to tell you, you know, right. hey, we've got an agenda, and at two o'clock you got to go go back to your right. room and go, like you said, go That's back it. to your group, make a make a choice, and go back to your group. <laughs> that really taught me draw a chart. Yeah, exactly. That really taught me about bringing the kids in and having the conversation with the kids and how important it was also to front load their interests. Our job was to create a certain structure, facilitation, and a knowledge and awareness of certain deeper things that we know, but really to front load their experience and create space for them to have the experience they need to have for transformation. Yeah, yeah. And um, so- Kind of yeah. going back to that to that parent, w- once once I explained to that parent and, and thanking that parent for trusting me and leaning in, I talked about some of the things that have historically happened at the school and t- talk about the emergence of that multiracial space and then to situate that child in that multiracial space and talk about the things that could be done there and how that child could find their voice and overcome some of the issues and heal some of the issues they've had as a multiracial person in a way that that this is where my preacher hat turns on that I feel that only new roads can do. It's literally, I'm, I'm I'm committed to that. I'm like, listen, you can spread it around and ease it around and, 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 and parse it out in different places, but you will never find a place where all of it is contained in one space and it is just, it will literally heal that and heal that in a way that, uh, again, is holistically integrated. It doesn't feel like someone came and tapped and, and, oh, and by the way, going back to, let me close this conversation on holistic integration. I mentioned that experience because what it taught me was, okay, when you introduce measures that are bringing people together across that wide spectrum of difference, that has to happen holistically. You don't want to put signs up where people walk in and it literally says black, Latino, white. <laughs> okay, that doesn't work. You have to do that holistically in a way that calls folks in and feels natural for them. And so now we have this concept, holistic integration, where when we design things, we design for that, that you're going to blend people together and you're going to mix them up. So it is still the intentional part of the work, but you have to do that holistically you cannot do that in a way that makes people feel just weird okay (laughs) so how how does that work like you know i don't want to spend too much too long on this but 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 how do you get people to go to you know go to the right room (laughs) so so one of the things that so this is what happens with the with the the affinity work is that the affinity work they do a lot of work within their own groups themselves and then there are spaces where the affinity group leaders are required to all come together and plan larger events to call in the entire larger student community so you're you're kind of leveraging these student leaders right this is another thing that that founding head of school taught me is you need to know when you talk about climate and culture, like our head of school currently is obsessed with the notion of climate and culture. Great. I'm the climate and culture guy. What happens though that I've hipped him to is, well, Luther, climate and culture, when adults use that language is different than climate and culture when kids use that language. Okay. So we are not invited into their climate and culture. Okay. <laughs> We can beg and prod and ask, okay, and sneak by and have, you know, little spies that kind of tell us things about it, but it's a different wave of experience. So what I've learned to do is to have active engagement with the student climate and culture and to make sure that I have an organized relationship with those leaders in Mm. those spaces. There's active engagement between the adult and, and student climate and culture, and we are intentionally coming together and, and again, leveraging their leadership to call more students in. Then we're trying to tip the, the climate and culture threshold of the entire community, the field of engagement, so that the environment, the vibe, the feel of the school says, kind of establishes boundaries for you, if you will. In other words, you don't need someone to come up to you and tell you there's we don't speak to women in our community like this or we don't use certain language. I I eschew those types of exchanges. I don't want to have to go up to a young person and tell them, you know, you don't talk to women X, Y and Z, because I actually feel like that's when you're going to miss me with that kind of traditional language. What, What I'd like to do is I'd like to have things happen within the context of the New Roads experience that I can appeal to direct your attention around and say, hey, do you know how that came about? 
Let me tell you about the young women who organized that, why they put that together and what they're trying to do with that and what role you can have with that. Now I'm getting you to think about how, you know, issues around how you engage females within our community and how they want to be regarded or treated. But I'm not turning it into this conversation around you need to be told how to talk to women in our community. Well, so, OK, so let me ask you. I mean, OK, so it's a school. And this place you're talking about, it's a school, it's a, co it's a college preparatory school. Everybody who graduates is, is eligible, is, has everything on their transcript that they need to get into a four-year university. They, can, they make choices on their own about where, they, where to go and whether to go and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there's this, there's this like gigantic academic piece. And it sounds like, is, is, it, is it the case that that uh, the role of shepherding, of crafting, shepherding, guiding this uh, this historically non-schoolish piece of their education rests on a handful of shoulders and yours in particular? Well, so a lot, a lot of the work that I do is about capacity building and expanding that outwards and, and building infrastructure that is oriented outwards. Building so infrastructure with the students or with the faculty well, or both? With kind of with in, 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 with, within all those constituencies, kind of sprinkling that through the parent through the parent uh, um, uh, population, sprinkling mm -hmm. that through the administrative population, the faculty population, the staff population, the student population, so that the work is, the, 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 the seeds are planted in all those spaces and they're germinating, again, oriented outwards so that you're building infrastructure that expands outwards so that it doesn't become select individuals, right? right? So right. that it doesn't right. become about right. certain people. Right, got it, got it. Um, so one of the things that's got to be floating around people's minds right now is, uh, you know, you know, unfortunately, it all gets conflated. But but there is the there is the conversation about woke, and uh, you know the a s certain groups of people have done a masterful a job as they have done frequently in the past of taking what was once. Um, what was once a term to refer to a uh, healthy, progressive, um, right-minded practices and attitudes and approaches and turned it into something evil, right? I mean, and, um, and the idea of critical race theory, right? I mean, those two things. So, so can you talk some about, about how both of those, I don't even, I, I'm, I'm less focused on the language, but both of those arenas are affecting education if they are at, at the at the middle school, high elementary, middle, high school level. I mean, what, how is that? You're right. I mean, woke used to be <laughs> when it first became, when it first entered the culture, it was, it referred to having your eyes open to certain realities in our society. And uh, it has become, you know, in this really brilliant and masterful way where nobody was in charge of it, but the, uh, suddenly, it's, I mean, I, we, you know, I watched the program yesterday with Shelly, my wife, and, um, and we both, at the, it was terrible. And we both at the end of it was like, oh my God, that was just so woke, meaning the negative. And so he was like, so it worked, right? It worked. The, uh, it was, you know, it was cliched and stupid and making an issue out of something that wasn't an issue. And it was like, what is this? How, right? So, so is that, has, has that affected the conversations that students are having or you're having or teachers are having? And then, and then what do you make of the whole critical race theory conversation? We know, we know that it, it no longer means what it meant. So, um, so I know that's a lot. I just packed. I just threw. I just threw a hundred jigsaw puzzle on the table in front of you. So, so you know, it's only a thousand pieces. So put it together. 
<laughs> I can follow you though. I can follow you. <laughs> well, let me start with the woke thing is that yeah. um, you're right, is that it got hijacked and it means something very different, I think, than the folks who introduced it meant. Right. Just like I think that the term politically correct got hijacked. Totally. There's and... another brilliant one a moment of like suddenly pro politically correct is back. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, um, yeah. and there are countless other instances in the culture where you try to introduce something or progressivism tries to introduce something. And progressivism, I've just determined that progressivism, the progressive strain in this country cannot match the ability to denigrate and belittle like the forces of conservatism can, the forces that want to hold on to Brilliant. certain structures. They just can't. They just cannot keep up with it. No. No, you know, just, the, the cynicism, there's something about, and I, I, I let me see, I, I always mess his name up. Uh, Anon, the gentleman, he's the persuaders, he has the book, you know, he does the, the work on philanthropy. God, I can't think of this brother's name. I always, I know you know who he is, David, uh, we talked about him before. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I, I just, I mentioned him because he does a lot of conversation around uh, the way that the left gets locked into this preachy type of an attitude and tries to engage this high-minded type of dictates that loses people, whereas the right understands that there's something really base about human emotion and psychology. And you just play on it, use it to your advantage, and move forward, period. And, <laughs> and they and win. So, <laughs> I think that that's very, very true. And I think that plays out in this woke, uh, politically correct conversation. Because I remember back in the 90s during the politically correct era when it became, oh, well, that's so politically correct. And I said, well, I remember saying to someone in, in a college classroom once, well, what do you think? Because they so derided the notion of political correct. And I said, well, let me make sure I understand. Do, do you want to be able to call people Orientals and say the N word and call gays the F word? I mean, what? Do you, well, no, I wouldn't do that. And I said, well, what is your understanding of politically correct? Because there used to be a time in our culture where that was acceptable. That's what you did. I grew up in that culture. You well, it was the it was the pri privileging of, you know, it started out by being look that term politically correct. It has that word correct in it because everybody felt like, well, geez, that. What we were doing was wrong. This is really correct. And suddenly it was just like politically and and it's just sort of dismissive in that sort. So it's shift the emphasis. And woke is that, wait, woke was like, okay, what happens when you open your eyes? What do you see? What do you see? And we can debate whether or not that's there, or whether you're seeing correctly, or but just it's become this wholesale dismissal of being awake to what's happening. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I want to add to this conversation the uh the um uh God, I cannot think of the name exactly the movement, but you're gonna know when I mention it. I don't remember the the other the tagline for it, but it was the the Wall Street folks, the folks that were doing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Occupy Wall Street. There we go, Occupy Wall Street. Now that that conversation was so important because what they did on a national level was to draw attention to this whole idea of the one percenters. And the what the one percenters did was it drew people's attention to a, a statistical awareness of the allocation of resources. Right. And so one of the things that you could see was just this ridiculous situation where the majority of the resources were in the hands of such a small amount of people in a country like the United States that says it's about freedom and democracy and opportunity. And you saw that directly flying in the face of that myth, that narrative about the country. And you were now being faced with the reality of what the numerical distribution of power actually looked like. And what and again, what happens is that uh, is the 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 social forces that that fight in front of us will reduce this conversation almost to a caricature, to ridiculousness. But right. they're fighting for very big stakes in the background. Okay, I mean the idea of actually interrupting American culture and the way the business is done in the country is very threatening to very very powerful forces. Right. Okay. And, 
and 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 so it 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 plays out through these these popular culture symbols and so when you think about you know the, the again that George Floyd mo Floyd moment being married with woke culture and massive numbers of people taking to the streets and you know again with back to the new roads environment we facilitated a town hall at that time and just educating the students and making the students of all the things that we talked about one of the things that was the most meaningful to me conversations that we had during that time was I was able to bring to the students through some activists who were doing some statistical work that the George Floyd protests and the, 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 the marches and movements and the engagement was larger than any of the movements short of the March on Washington in the 1960s. And they really couldn't believe that because the mythology of how the civil rights movement was built up after it had taken place was much larger than the movement itself. You know, my grandfather used to tell me that when I was a kid. He used to say, you know, boy, there was just a couple of people, there's a couple of Negroes, crazy Negroes marching downtown and stuff and asking the city counters, and they were they were idiots. And you know, and 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 I guess some cameras started watching them, and next thing you know, white folks decided to change. That was his interpretation of it because in a on a lib level, he didn't see massive numbers of people in the mm. streets and things like that. And so giving the kids a, a grounded, landed picture of actually what it means when you when you get people directly in direct engagement, direct activism, direct involvement, and making them understand. Listen, the United States actually we have a we have a cultural mythology, and then we have actual occurrences in the country. We don't really have a big we, we, protest culture. A lot of times in this country can be very isolated. But it doesn't really become responsive of big systematic matters like they do in Europe, right? When you talk about protest movements in Europe, they tend to be much deeper, broader in scale, and they have a much wow. deeper philosophical and historical rooting of what they're trying to address when you see social movements take place. And, you know, kind of getting the kids to see we're still engaged in a sociocultural and historical battle that is still playing out right now. And it took place, it, it, the first expression of it was civil war, then reconstruction, then the civil rights movement, then moving forward to the George Floyd movement and, and kind of giving them a landed picture and having them now start to really kind of put their teeth into, oh, okay, we're able to see what these social forces are battling over what they actually look like in our lives. And I think that's unfortunately the piece that we miss is how do we land this for the young people so it doesn't get appropriated, caricature, caricatured, and reduced down to you know what's happened with woke right right and so now woke is the most ridiculous thing uh, you know another example i love to use david is that famous moment in american popular uh uh culture history of disco is dead right where <laughs> disco is dead takes over but we know now from 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 cultural historians that talk about the problem that was happening in conservative circles surrounding discos because discos actually became integrated centers where for the first time in American culture, nightlife, black and white people were going to the same disco clubs and fucking dancing. Dancing, bodies touching, alcohol. We all know where that goes, okay? Yes, we later, do. later later in the evening, we all know where that where that goes. And it was transforming American culture. You uh, started having shifts of that's interesting. I never knew that. Yeah, you start having shifts of the social relationships. And next thing you know, you have disco is dead. Now disco has gone off of all of the radio stations. Radio stations are now resegregated again. R&B music is over here. Rock music is over here. Black music there, white music there. They don't speak to each other. And you were essentially back where you were prior to the 60s. But that's really interesting. And I, so, I, would, I would love uh, to know more about that. Yeah. So kind of grounding... Yeah grounded this is what i always loved the most about teaching philosophy when you know when you were you were when you were head of school there and you you know said you know that's how you kind of sucked me into the whole thing you're like hey i'm gonna you know i got a philosophy class you could teach this to, to seniors was helping this the, the the students take real world tools 
ground those tools in an analysis of the movements of social currents. Mm. And then they can understand this better because I said to a, a student very simply, I said, well, you know, woke is just a new expression of Plato's cave. I said, you know, Plato told us that we were witnessing a world of shadows. How do you move beyond looking at the world and existing in the world of shadows and step out into the light? and mm. actually see it for what it is and build and engage the direct reality. What would that actually be like? And I said, well, Woke is doing the exact same thing. I said, I'm not defending or negating e either way. I'm just saying to you, the paradigm that it's set up is trying to engage the same basic concept, which is how do you move beyond myth, illusion, and narrative in order to engage authenticity? And in American culture, that's even more difficult because there are so many forces that benefit from the myth, the illusion, the narrative. And 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 how do you? Well, is the conversation of critical race theory uh, uh, alive at New Road School, or nobody pays attention to it because it's so embedded in? Well, I think that there, there is there there is a general feel that we already are the dark side. Okay, yeah. I think we yeah. However, yes, I will say we have still had questions about you know what well, critical race theory and is that is that what New Roads is doing? And we explain you know again I explain well first is a, you know trying to cover some basics for folks. Hey, it's a loss. It's 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 a legal theory. Um, let's ground it where it is, you know, the work that Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw were doing around intersectionality and, 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 and critical race theory and, and with the role that it played in, in, the, in, in, in law and establishing that first. And then I say to them, okay, no, New Roads is not practicing critical race theory. Are there some overlaps between what they're doing there? Yeah, just like in, in any history. I mean, I imagine you could take even some of the worst things that are done even in conservative movements and there may be overlaps with some things that we're doing because that's the way academics work. That's the way yeah, academia I, works. I think, I, think, I think when I hear it, what's the, is there a rational kernel? Is there a, you know, is there a nugget of something valid and real and in, in what people are complaining about uh, under this now misnomer, but, you know, that, that has been successfully <laughs> renamed as critical race theory. What they're, what they're complaining about is, geez, uh, or what they're saying at the, at the bottom of that is, well, nobody Geez, nobody should be made to feel bad because of their race. And, you know, everybody thinks that's true. Of course, <laughs> it's, rare, it, it's very rare <laughs> that, that uh, you know, it's been true for a lot of people for many years. They've felt bad because of their race. They have been made to feel bad because of their well, race well, it, in well, all is, sorts of absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Well, right. this is this is the issue: is that that there's a very inauthentic presentation of that that issue because sure. what will happen is that you know, and you have again. That's why I referred to earlier the forces, even some of the forces that are presented to us that look progressive, that really are forces that want to keep things situated the way they were, side A, side B. Right. And and so you 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 often get the framing of that is, well, people don't want to feel bad because of their race. They don't complete that in saying, but the establishment of the country was specifically originated around disenfranchising people because of their race. And there have not been remediative measures right. that have extracted the structures that sustain that. So it's not, you know, it's not very difficult to to complete well, yeah, the rest that, of that. that. I mean, I, I I think the practices it it is obviously a different world, right? That we, are we a post racial society? Absolutely not. It is it's a very different world than it was back you know three hundred years ago, uh, in actual lived practices, um, and and a lot of people, or at least a, a, a cluster of people want those advantages, want to retain the advantages that they have had and, uh, and keep others disadvantaged because it's, it's economically 
advantageous. It is socially advantageous. It is in all sorts of ways different advantageous to certain groups. And and the pointing out of those disparities and the historical roots of that um, is dangerous, right? It is dangerous. And so the idea that, which I, you know, would be really interesting to know if that's really the case that white kids feel bad when they hear that there were slaves, they feel bad about being white. I don't know if that's actually, I don't know if there's a way to make, right. if to, to find out anyways, the, the, the climate has been so contaminated, it's hard to imagine how to, to really tease that out. But, but um, and so jumping on that possibility, which everybody thinks, anybody thinks is like, well, shit, Nobody should feel bad because of what color they are. And, you know, so sure, we don't want people to feel bad, but it's, but, but I'm not even sure that it's, that that is anywhere, was anywhere in the picture. But boy, was that a convenient device to, to dissuade people from educators in particular from diving into the to the historical realities and i don't mean the historical reality specifically of slavery but but what slavery allowed people to do for their own uh benefit right so so i'm going to use this thing which is terrible sure people shouldn't feel bad because of the colors why should anybody feel bad that's what we know that's reprehensible in fact that's woke, right? We know that that's a bad thing. And, and you're, everybody's eyes are open to that. But we're going to use that to make sure that those conversations don't happen. And I don't even think, it, who, I, don't, I don't even know if it's the, you know, what's, his, what's, what's Florida boy's name? DeSantis, just, you know, I don't think he has that in like, you know, he's just using the whole thing to his advantage is my story. But I don't think he wants to pay, make people feel good or bad or whatever, like whatever. And I don't even think he knows that he's using it as that, but he's using it for a different advantage. But, but it just seems, it just seems so on its face obvious that this is a, a sort of a desperate and clever way of holding on and holding on to holding on to the advantages of certain of certain sorts and the unreal advantages i mean you know so often so often uh people vote against their interests right i mean they 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 protest against their own interests as if somehow they're the ones who are you know, oh, am I supposed to feel bad? <laughs> no, you're supposed to feel bad because you're in a lousy job where you're not paid enough and you're not given enough benefits because those people want you to be upset about that. I don't know if that was coherent. Oh, absolutely, but... absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, that that's why for ruling classes in the United States, you have the the most ideal paradigm, right? You have right Democrats and Republicans who are elites. And it really doesn't matter if they battle back and forth amongst themselves, because as long as the landscape stays the same of back and forth, then markets are not interrupted. Right. You know, right. I mean, or at least I shouldn't say they're not interrupted. You can. They're, yeah, they're not interrupted because you can predict their movement, whether they only have two options of where they're going. They're swinging back to the left. They're swinging to the right. right. <laughs> OK. And the, the volatility is reduced significantly. And capital is then able to be predictable and you're able to extract more under predictable circumstances. Right. Right. Yeah. And the, 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 you know, poor folks trying to, you know, get themselves out of the, the, the sociocultural quagmire that is a part of all that requires some other force, which I do think there's all, this is always a cat and mouse type of a uh, of a landscape uh, because you know I look at what is happening with technology for example like technology is so interrupted that the the entire process which you know and it could it can go either which way but it has created an environment where 
it has upset the predictability of how the narrative and the myth can be controlled. Uh. Right. And for example, all this conversation around TikTok, right? There's all this conversation around now banning, around banning TikTok, right? Because TikTok makes it very difficult to maintain the social narrative, the myths and the narratives when you have people with direct engagement, millions and millions, if not billions of people with direct engagement who are telling their stories, telling history, being direct about their expression and experience of history. And it, it, it to have that happening at the same time that you have a conversation around uh, around an insistence on banning books and uh, uh, this conversation can't happen and I don't want kids to feel bad in class, to have that conversation happen at the same time where a kid could be in class, pick up one of these in class, right, and have access to all of that, right, while you're denying them access to that themselves. We all know there's a certain ridiculousness to that. It makes it clear that it's not really about that. It's about something else. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and, and, and again, this is the reason why places like New Roads become so important because trying to create an environment where you're preparing the next generation of leaders to be able to uh, wade through all of that noise and confusion in order to make, be able to make sense of it. You know, one of the things that we've been discovering is that, um, listen, we have to start to really engage kids around media literacy and these kinds of conversations. These kinds of conversations are actually becoming more important than, you know, creating opportunities around learning around activism and preparing them about how to be activists. Well, this is kind of even actually larger than that because, this, this, this is the place where they're going to call all the tools and everything they use as activists. So they need to be able to move through all of this and have skills to be able to do that. And so it just, it again, reminds me of something that, again, you used to say, you know, 15 some odd years ago, you would say, we don't know what they're going to need to know 20 years from now. So what we're teaching them has to be a perspective and a way of engaging and interfacing with the world and seeking Absolutely. truth and clarity and honesty and authenticity right. because the landscape is so dynamic, you, you cannot imagine what it's going to look like. Absolutely. You can think you can, but you can't. You really can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, from, uh, you know, just a, another thing I want to share on the CRT piece that is so troubling for me that gets missed about CRT that I do directly bring to our inclusion discourse at New Roads. And that is a centerpiece to Derek Bell's critical uh, 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 race theory um, is this notion of interest convergence. He had this concept called interest convergence. And what he did with interest convergence, he said he went through all of the significant civil rights measures that had ever been taken uh, uh, or remediative measures that had ever been taken around race in American culture, and he compiled a compendium. And in looking at this compendium, he said, okay, one thing becomes clear. Whenever there has been a remediative measure that has been embraced by the American public as a whole, it has been one that has benefited white people also. So then Derek Bell says, his concept of interest conversion is, well, the first two waves of social progress to move us beyond the apartheid history that we had should be centered in interest convergence. We should focus on the things where our interests come together and converge so we know what we don't have to fight about and say, right. yes, we all agree. And, and now I have never had an audience that I presented that to that did say, yes, yes, that's exactly what I want to hear. And then when I say to them, that's the centerpiece of, of critical race theory. You know, right. and I say, I want you to think about who this man was and what he was trying to do. He was very, he was very conservative himself. Derek Bell was very conservative. He was not a radical, okay? That's not the guy he was, yeah. okay, <laughs> at all. And he would be the measured guy to move us along the path right. of social parity. Hey, take the simple, the low-hanging fruit first. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. He said, and yeah. so I I get very frustrated sometimes when when because we miss things like interest convergence 
the football gets thrown way down the field. And now we start screaming at each other about pronouns and things like that when there are other fundamental things that we have not even moved through yet to have clarified and have manifest at the social policy level such that you know issues like pronouns and things like that are not such a big die on the hill fight right exactly yeah i feel exactly the same way and which is not to say people should you know people should die on the hill to 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 keep the pronouns the way they are or absolutely like i want to respect that, that also absolutely. i want to make that clear to don't misinterpret yeah. that to mean yeah. that yeah. there's not respect for that issue right no exactly yeah yeah it's uh it's always bothered me that well if we've had this i think we may have had this conversation just like it really bothered me as a person who was teaching kids to write that that suddenly the plural pronoun was okay and they didn't have to worry about agreement anymore and i insisted that they did have to worry about agreement when they were referring to a singular person as they, I'm okay with that. But if it was just one person going to the store, it wasn't they are going to the store. They is going to the store. Exactly correct. And that really bothered everybody. <laughs> just really, right. it, was my, it was my act of rebellion, not against the underlying idea, but against... Can't you come up with a different pronoun? <laughs> well, mine mine had to do with the 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 almost universal agreement that you couldn't use the singular, you couldn't use it because it was dehumanizing. And right. then right. it was, well, okay, but we just decided that it was dehumanizing. Didn't we just decide that about they? If we can make decisions, can't we just decide that can't it's just no longer it's dehumanizing? It, it's pretty good. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> um, so dare we, and forgetting for a second the conversation about the schools, although obviously everything, everything plays in. Um, reparations. How do you feel about that? And I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie that to, um, to you know, there, there is a, there is a. A sort of rejuvenation of and a historical um there's a history of conservative and i don't necessarily mean, i don't mean trumpish i mean conservative black thinkers intellectuals in this world and there's a, a resurgence uh among a certain slice of that world that I'm not even sure they're all, I'm not even sure they're conservative, but uh, careful thinkers who have, who come out differently from the uh, the more progressive social movements. So I'm thinking of people like, um, I don't know if you, Glenn Lowry, who's an yeah, economist, a um, guy named John McWhorter, who's a linguist. Uh, you know, I know all those guys. Co Coleman Hughes, who's actually Absolutely. a kid, who's really quite, quite good. Um, or something, Thomas Sewell, Sewell. Sewell, who yes. an economist, I think. So, so, um, so, where are you in that? Well, how, how do you, how do you, or do you, incorporate any of their insights, or respond to their points of view? Which, in certain ways, I suspect, you know, I suspect if we all, if we were all sitting in a room, we would get we would get to the point where we understand that we're pretty much talking about the same thing. But I think, um, I think it appears that they're on a different side. And, and, and I'm wondering how you feel about that. Uh, well, just let me just give some broad strokes, you know, from the beginning is that I am of the mindset that, that you will never move in a significant way, the the social barometer, the sociocultural barometer around this issue without reparations. There's the 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 the, the level of uh, assault and offense that African Americans encountered as a demographic. There's no other way around that. There is no other way around addressing that issue. Now, what 
happens is 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 that um, we get lost in the details about what that looks like, right? Um, and there are many different proposals of what that look what that looks like. The first thing I'd like to do is to disavow in any way um, these caricature renditions of re reparations, right? You know, um, that are that are quite frankly racist in 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 their origin, right? Where a bunch of folks are just lined up for something free for a check, give me this, where are my reparations, okay? You know, um, taking the conversation out of that zone and really respecting the conversation, um, there's, th when you look at the economic reality of where Black America is that so specifically happened to them as a demographic and, and you know, looking at what, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Hannah Nicole Jones and what she's doing with the 1619 Project and looking at some of the things she uncovers just as historical truths and realities, really establishing the deep economy of the United States literally being founded on the, 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 the grinding, if you will, to provide a metaphor there of black bodies. OK, L you know, literally where where people had lifespans that were tossed out afterwards to do certain functions that establish infrastructure that became the foundational infrastructure of the country. And then looking at where Black America is today, finding itself in, uh, in many instances, the lowest economic demographic of many groups that in mass arrived in the country afterwards and essentially took advantage of the infrastructure that they had created. And so, it's very difficult to authentically have a meaningful conversation. And I'm going to include this part too in a, in, a, in, a, in a country that part of its national mythology, narrative, and lore is Christian based, right? To not have a conversation meaningfully about what is the recompense to those people. Okay. I think that's the only way you really stop just the noise. The noise is such a noisy conversation. And the majority of the noise just takes the place, uh, centers around, well, there was never anything done to make those people whole, okay? You know, passing a civil rights law is not about making those people whole. It's just saying, that's just saying, okay, well, we're, we're, we're living up to when we said all men were created equal. Now we're putting a little bit of force behind it, right. but that's not, do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's not really, that's not really recompense for those yeah. people. And so there was never anything, even when yeah. you're looking at native Americans, right. And then that you do have a legal basis in 40 acres and a mule, right. You have a legal basis for compensation. Then when you add to that, that the first big national reparations movement took place after Reconstruction when white slave owners were compensated for their losses, <laughs> for, their, for their slaves, yes. and the slaves were just cast off the land right. and sent out to be terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan to be driven out of states, out, you know, out of the South in mass. I think that it's, it, it is all but impossible to move forward as a nation without there being a collective conversation around reparations. For me, practically, the way that that takes place is really through an institutional approach. I don't think it ever should descend to a conversation around checks and people and that kind of stuff. Right. But there should be an institutional approach, right? There should have long ago been a national trust set up so that Black families can get educated. Black families can say, we're going to buy our first piece of property. We can, the, right? There have there are smaller cities now that are Healthcare. doing things like well, that. Like, well, there's, all sorts of, there's all sorts of institutions and practices that, that would avoid writing a check, you know, or, you know, or, or, or having to sit down we're having to sit down after the meal and say, okay, we had the bacon, lettuce, and tomato, and exactly had the, whatever. You had the liverwurst, so that's like exactly. whatever. It, you know, that, because that's, that, that goes nowhere, it seems to me that. But it but goes nowhere in institutional it's practices. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insulting. And, and it also, it also ties it, it ties the conversation to slavery, which 
it, uh, it's not that that wasn't real, but so even if there wasn't slavery, the way people have been treated historically, certain groups of people have been treated historically, is like, well, yeah, okay, my grandfather wasn't a slave, but that doesn't mean my grandfather, my great grandfather, my whatever, what were not mistreated, kept from, kept from participating in, denied this, denied that. So, so, and or or me, right? Absolutely. Not me, but and, you. and and most and most importantly, uh, you know, which this is the part where I do take some 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 a, a certain level of guidance from the conservative black voices where they some of them have done economic analyses and you start talking about public policy and you start talking about black and brown bodies that finance that right you know when you look at homestead you look at social security you look at these big major public policy initiatives that move massive amounts of whites out of lower and working class up into the burgeoning middle class and it essentially being financed on the backs of poor black and brown people who enjoyed none of those benefits, right. who were excluded from those government programs. Right. The government participating in redlining and participating in, you know, uh, um, uh, sure. specified loans that are, right. All of this, again, is what I think critical race theory is trying to get to, mm -hmm. but again, that's why, as I was saying, the social forces immediately reduce it to a caricature because the social forces are actually very intelligent. They recognize that you have to stop it at this level before you get down to the micro level, because when you get down to the micro level, and this is what's what I think is really valuable and instructional about Hannah Nicole Jones' 1619 project, she does take us into the weeds. And she there's one part of it where she starts, she takes you to a Louisiana law at the turn of the century that's on the books where Blacks couldn't eat vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and she actually takes you into the micro weeds. And, and, and just when people think that that's ridiculous now, we're looking at all these, you know, bathroom laws and, 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 you know, who can do this and all these micro laws and targeted laws that are specifically directed to achieve a certain outcome. And you think, OK, they may sound ridiculous, but you're like, no, actually, they aren't ridiculous. They actually are part of uh, they serve a certain function in the stability, predictability of the landscape. Mm. And again, we're locked in because again, I, I'm not I'm not going to engage in kind of a both siderism to say, oh, you know, left and right are both is bad. I won't say that they're, they're just, but I will say that they are locked into a paradigm, and they both achieve their roles within that paradigm. And you know, I, I, because we're locked into that, I'm not ready to say one is is less valuable or more valuable than the other. It's just that we're fucked, okay? <laughs> it's more that kind of a thing. And the outcome that it's created as a as a as an experience is like no other. That's what makes America like no other. Um where you just end up with the most bizarre and crazy things that happen um in in the culture where you have something like, you know, um black people saying, "Well, the worst word that you can call me is the word that a group of my people sell on records every day to teenagers and tell them they need to regulate themselves because brown bodies can say a word when it comes up in the chorus, but the white bodies can't say you it when it comes up in the chorus. You but they're expected to spend time together in the same right. space because that is an indication of social parity and we've gotten to a great place together. But when that chorus comes up, you better know your lane. And you it, is. it is. It is. It has created an absurd world. Right, I mean, yeah. and, right, and if anybody pays we... attention to it for more than really, I mean, if honestly he pays attention to it, it's so obviously on his, obvious on his face that, this, oh, this is absolutely crazy, especially when it comes to kids. It's like, what? <laughs> we, yeah. tell the, we tell the boys, okay, I need you to use respectful language with the girls. And then the boys look at me as, oh, the girls who call themselves boss bitches, uh, don't you... You don't want me to call them a bitch, even though they call this as boss bitches. I'm like, can you, I have another meeting in 20 minutes. Can you just make this easy for me? Can you please? 
I needed to come and talk to you today. Just come on. Don't do it. You know, don't rake me over the coals today. Okay. Because that's what I love about New Roads. Our kids are deeply trained in the ridiculousness of it all. Okay. <laughs> oh. So tell me what when you when you read somebody like you know Glenn Lowry or McWhorter or those guys, what what do you make of that? Well, I, I do understand that there is a, a current, it kind of goes back to the roots of African-American progressivism, right? This, this um, kind of uh, Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Booker T. Washington, you know, W.B. Du Bois type of an approach, right? You know, should we be self-sufficient and fully reliant and not rely on any, you know, governmental and social structures and it's all about self-reliance versus there are these systemic matters that we need to plug into and that the systems need to speak to our reality and so they i look at those guys kind of as a manifestation of that and i think they are important voices i'm not one of these persons also that are so disturbed by them that i want to silence them i appreciate them uh, you know sometimes uh sometimes they can enter bizarre zones but i can engage that just like i you know, have seen the left going some really bizarre places that I'm like, uh, dude, I am not with that. I can't okay. Get there. That, <laughs> okay. So, no, I can't get there. you know, yeah. I can, I can, I, I can kind of yeah. hold both the, 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 the two of those. For me, they're very, very important also to uh, the larger uh, 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 American uh, population to say that there are differentiated voices within the African-American experience. They are not all right. the same voices and they do not all perceive an experience in the same way. Right. Which I think is one of those, you know, those dangerous places that people absolutely live, and especially people who are not part of the culture is like, so speaking for all Jews, what do you think of the Holocaust? Huh? <laughs> so Mario, tell me, what do you think of slavery? Really? <laughs> I like it. I really think it was. Good. I know, really. Uh, it's what, okay, what, okay what with me, my, right? <laughs> what, are you about? what am I supposed to say to that? Yeah. Yeah. And, well, like, and, yeah. and again, going back to this interest convergence, again, a centerpiece concept, because I make sure that our kids at New Roads are always centered in interest conversions, right? I had recently, uh, we had the whole Kanye thing went down last year with the crazy Kanye statement. So the JSU, the Jewish Students Union, came to me, were very agitated. And they were agitated. They were agitated not only by Kanye, they were agitated with the, with many more wounds beyond that. And the, 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 the locus of their wounds had to do with, we are seen, people look at us as just a, a, a separate group of complaining white people, as they said to me. Okay, but they said, Mario, we have a distinct culture and experience that is that is a thing that is, is that separates from general whiteness. Okay, and it gets missed. And this whole Kanye thing is so we got into a conversation, and then they 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 say to me, you know, um, you know, I'm I'm engaging them. I want to I want to give some shape and direction to their frustration so that they can again they can amplify it and and call us in, right? Because you know, teenagers. The, the, and the teenagers are a reflection of our culture. And our New Roads kids are amongst some of the most enlightened, but they're teenagers. So their first reaction is to direct their frustration outwards. And so they say, well, you know, Mario, well, when the Black and Latino kids have an issue, like the whole school stops, there's a whole freaking assembly, everybody's there, everybody's listening. We have an issue, nobody says anything, nobody cares, you know, and, you know, this. And so I said, okay, let me just stop and I say, you know, you all know that the NAACP was started by Jews, right? Okay. And you all know that, you know, of course, they didn't know any of this. I'm just kind of educated. You all know that the civil rights movement, the financing was basically all Jews, right? And they were like, really? I'm like, you think that Black people had any freaking money in the freaking 60s? Okay. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, every time the activists went to jail, all of the attorneys you know, or all Jewish attorneys. I said, go back and check all that. They were all Jews. I said, I can't think of anyone who wasn't Jewish. Okay. And, and so we kind of get into that. And so they, they, you know, they're, they're really feeling affirmed and heard. So then I landed and I say to them, what I don't want to see happen is what usually happens is 
a, a, a marginalized group has something that happens to them and they want a platform to be able to express themselves and immediately they come into the space and it becomes about the other people who occupy the platform rather than the fact that all of us marginal voices have been reduced to one freaking platform rather than the whole pie. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I really want to call your attention to this important moment of calling in so that there doesn't, we don't put together this black and Jewish tension and we add to that. Okay. That's what Kanye is doing. Kanye is taking one piece of black Jewish tension and he's elevating that and escalating that rather than saying, I could just as easily turn your attention here and show you how we've actually worked together and we've, we've achieved different outcomes when it is that we're working together. And so really bringing kids into a space where we're able to hear one another and start and focus on our interest convergence first. So I said to those kids, I introduced them to the concept of interest convergence and said, what is some of the things that the, you've seen the Black and Latino students do that you can use to bring people in because they do have a more extensive relationship with direct activism because there you you I, I'm, I'm assuming you are acknowledging there is a white presenting privilege that you have that you can't be and they said yes we acknowledge that Mario and I said okay so there's going to be certain things they can bring in they can teach you they said okay yes and I said there's going to be things that you could teach them so I, we bring those groups together it and and you know of course the philosopher and me wants to like freeze the room and like explain interest convergence to them. They need to get the concept. And they tell me, Mario, shut up. We don't know what all that shit means that you're trying to explain, but we're ready to work together. But they were like living out interest convergence right there. And I'm like, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Because now we're using the energy we have to build rather than 90% of it is done just taking a breath, screaming at each other and getting all of our frustration out. And we got 10% to, to organize around. We now we have 90% to organize around because we only spent 10% of our energy like well, frustration. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Well, Mario, I, I am looking at the clock here and uh, you're probably looking at the clock there. And this is your vacation, which I am so grateful that. So what what else needs to be said? Well, I have a, I have a question for you. Uh, apropos of nothing or everything. Um, who, who do you admire? in this world and who like you know and i don't know what admire means in that conversation is admire is it uh uh, uh look at as the hero as a hero is like when you is it the same person as when you were growing up is it like so uh, so who, I'm gonna who, make do you, who do you look at for inspiration that's a really great question it's a really great question i'm gonna make this very simple so when i was young i um, went, went to college and I did the whole thing of, you know, working full time, going to school at night, community college, you know, you know, so I did the whole, you know, bootstrap thing, you know, and as part of that, as a bourgeoisie aspirant, African-American, you know, in the eighties, nineties, um, I was, I was on my path. I was, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go to law school and then I'm going to, and I remember that. And I came across this little independent school that I got caught up in that really resonated with me. But even more so, there was a head of school who oh, I had seen work in a way that I had never seen someone work before. I had never seen someone not perform work. I had been taught how to perform work, okay? You know, especially as a black man, right? You know, you you never get loud. You 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 always do this. Make sure you clear your desk immediately. Make sure you do this. You, you smile at everyone. You don't ever tell anyone your business. You don't ever talk to anybody about this. You don't ever get into any kind of personal conversation. Get out of there, 502. The, the, you know, if it's five o'clock, 502, you're in the fucking car, okay? Don't ever go to any of those drink things or whatever they have there, because you know, you, you know, I, I've been taught all of the freaking bourgeoisie aspirin rules, and I had not thought, I didn't understand this at that time, but what it was, was it was disembodied engagement is actually what I've been taught, right? Is to engage by disembodying and just showing up and performing a function. So I had never seen a, 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 a leader occupy space 
in the way that this individual did of bringing his full person, his full self to that space and really showing up and a lot of imperfection. And then I saw at that time, you know, New Road started out as a campus in the center of Los Angeles, the black center of Los Angeles. And then on the West side, I saw all of these very hopeful, but agitated black people who had a lot of demands and expectations taking him to task about a lot of shit that they wanted. And he remained embodied and he held his space and he engaged those people and he was present with them. And it just, it did something to me and it just, it changed me. And it made, it, it spoke to <laughs> things that I didn't know I needed. I didn't know that I needed to be fully whole and embodied. And that continued for many, many, many years, even into his retirement and watching him retire and remain engaged and remain active and remain a part of the world and remain, you know, healthy and remain in good spirit and remain cosmically inclined and connected. And so you freaking figure it out, David, what my inspiration is. Oh, that makes that's that's so sweet. That's really just that 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 may be one of the nicest. I, I love you for it, man. Thank you. That's uh, you know, I, I I'm glad that I'm glad that you don't see all of me, or maybe you do, and that's okay. And uh, well, that was the best about being in an environment like that. You can't hide any of it. I saw all of you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> All right. And yeah. always, that's the way that I always was with kids. I see kids that I've had 20 years ago in the class and they say, you know, I will never forget your classroom because it was the way that you held space and, and the way the second week of class, you always told us I'm a fucking person. Don't fucking forget that I'm a fucking person. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said that. And they were yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, you probably said that. <laughs> Well, Mario, I, I'm so grateful for our opportunity to have a conversation, and I'm so grateful for you, and I'm I'm glad that I'm going to see you in a few weeks, and uh, I love you, man. I love you right back, David. This has oh. been a great experience. Oh.